Hello again. Now we start the journey. As I said uh, earlier, despite all the so-called trappings of success, I was literally running on empty in terms of spirit. And that emptiness that I talked about, nothing seemed to fill the void. And uh, yet, I was leading what, for all intents and purposes, was a successful life. And I'd been blessed all my life with um, good health. You know, when you're a pilot, you're examined rigorously to make sure you're fit to fly. And so I had no reason to suspect that that would not continue. But one day I woke up and we were at our cottage. And have you ever <laughs> slept on your arm or your leg in an odd position? You wake up and it's numb and tingly. Uh, what we used to say, your leg is asleep. Well, I woke up that morning and both my arms and my legs felt like that. I remember thinking, well, this is odd. Well, Lorraine had gone to church, but as I always did, I preoccupied myself with something else. And uh, when she came back, I said to her, boy, I don't feel well. And in fact, by early, by midday, I was feeling very ill. It was a Sunday and my wife is a nurse. And she said, well, you'd better see the doctor. So the next, on Monday, I made an appointment, went to see the doctor, and uh, he examined me and said, well, I think you have the flu. Just go home and sleep it off. And I did that. And, uh, but the next day, I was even more ill. And now I was getting concerned because I'd, I'd been blessed, as I said, with good health all my life, but now something was not right. And I could sense it was not right. And so... I went back in and saw him again, and same thing, go home, take some Tylenol. I did that. Um, another couple of days went by. I eventually went back, and now he's slightly annoyed that I'm bothering him. But I was losing the ability to walk. I was starting to stagger. And little did I know that I was coming down with a very rare disease. And, uh, and in fact, it's the kind of disease that if it isn't treated within a certain period of time, then it becomes critical. And in fact, after a week, there's no stopping this disease. And so I actually fell down in the parking lot. And um, at that point, my wife got involved and insisted that the doctor refer me to a, um, a neurologist. And uh, and thankfully, she did. <clears throat> the, they weren't sure what was going on. I seemed to be exhibiting symptoms of multiple sclerosis, which in itself is a terrible disease. And uh, my heart goes out to anyone who has that affliction. But uh, they admitted me, and they did a number of tests, uh, of course, and... Uh, but couldn't quite determine what was wrong with me. But all the while, I was losing the ability to even speak. My speech was slurred. I was having difficulty swallowing. My hands and fingers were curling inward, and uh, I was becoming numb, paralyzed from my legs up and from the fingertips in. Finally, a neurologist was, uh, was brought in, and uh, he uh, examined me. He had a colleague join him. and. Uh, you know, you would thought that at that point I might have looked up and said, you know, God, I don't know what's going on here, but if you're really out there, maybe you could give me a hand. Not me. In my absolute arrogance, the arrogance that I had with me all my life, I did not. Finally, after a battery of tests, uh, I'll never forget this, the doctor came in and said, Jim, we're going to do a lumbar puncture um, you when you first presented, we thought it was multiple sclerosis. It has similar things, but we think that you have contracted a disease that there's very little known about. And in fact, um, it has a window of opportunity to stop. And we are beyond that. And so I'm, 
I'm having trouble breathing, but I, I did manage to say, well, what is it? He said, well, we're going to do a lumbar puncture. We're going to take it right to the lab and I'll know within the hour. In fact, he was back in a rather short period of time. He had a vial of clear fluid and he said, Jim, uh, we have determined the nature of your illness. He said, you have a disease known as Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre. It's named after the two French doctors, Dr. Guillain and Dr. Barre, who first isolated the disease in the 1940s. And literally what happens is your own autoimmune system attacks the myelin sheath on your brainstem. And it would be akin to taking an extension cord and peeling the rubber coating off so that all the raw nerves, nerves are exposed. And, and the result of that is you have difficulty walking, talking. All the signals from your brain are haywire. Um, look, I'd never heard of it. I, I didn't understand it. But I knew what I was feeling. And I knew that this was bad. In fact, catastrophic. And the doctor said, we think because of your late diagnosis, uh, it's going to become a full blown. We've missed the window of opportunity to arrest it, but we're going to go ahead with the, the, the a rigorous uh, treatment of this disease. And the next few days were, were just a blur uh, as I underwent plasmapheresis and immunoglobulin therapies. Um, and he had said to me, this disease is critical because this paralysis comes up your legs and in your arms, and if it reaches your chest, your lungs shut down and you may die. Even then, even with that prognosis, in my arrogance and in my stupidity, never once did I call out to God and say, please help me. Not me, I'll handle this. I've survived engine outs, water landings, I'll get through this. My arrogance literally knew no bounds. I stand now absolutely mortified at my arrogance and ignorance. It got worse, but they rigorously applied the treatments. There was a critical period and they would measure the reaction of my muscles through an electrical stimulation system. And a couple of days later, he said to me, it seems as though it's not getting any worse, but it's going to be a long period of recovery. And it was. I mean, I was left with foot dragging and, uh, and all sorts of strange sensations, not unlike uh, diabetic neuropathy, where you can't feel your feet or your hands. But I got through it. And when I got home, um, they put me through, a, again, a rigorous uh, system of physiotherapy to learn to walk again. But because I had, con I had a full-blown case of Guillain-Barre, I was left with horrific pain. And I'm not talking nuisance pain. I'm not talking pain that, that's just uh, now and then. I'm talking crying out in the middle of the night pain, biting on my leather belt in the middle of the night so I wouldn't wake Lorraine. I never knew pain like that existed. And despite all, th all the additional therapies and neurological drugs and so on, none of it seemed to help. None of it. It got so bad that how I started my day was to literally fall out of bed crawl to a hot shower, curl up in a ball, and take the medication that they had prescribed. But it was just a temporary thing. And every time the pain cycled back, a week or so later, it would be even worse than the time before. And in my desperation, I saw um, um, a pain specialist. I saw a number of them. I tried various therapies. And I was prescribed for the first time narcotics. Narcotics. Me, who had never taken an aspirin. I mean, I literally never even took anything for a cold. I would recover so quickly. And now here I am, dependent on these narcotics to allow me to sleep, to allow me to walk, to have some semblance of function of a normal life. 
I had gone from a man who flew jets, who, who rode horses, who enjoyed fast cars, did all the things in life that, that many people enjoy. And here I was literally helpless, unable to care for myself without the nurses or without Lorraine. Did I ever cry out to God? Not once. I keep repeating my arrogance. That's what it was. And so from that, it just got worse and worse. And as Lorraine struggled to help me to learn to walk again, and I moved from a walker to dragging myself around the house. And as I said, I had foot dragging um, and, and I'd lost my reflexes. I, I couldn't step down from a high step. I had to find some way to get downstairs. And, and after I spent hour, you know, half an hour in a hot shower, I'd crawl out, get dressed and slide down the stairs to start my day. And that went on for a period of time, a long period of time, and it got worse and it got worse. And no matter how much I tried, nothing seemed to help. You know, I understand now better than any, than I ever did in my life, the dangers of becoming addicted to prescription drugs. My heart goes out to anyone who has a family member who is on that merry-go-round, which is an odd thing to say, of it never being enough. And so I became quite adept at thinking, well, if two prescriptions were good, then three must be better. If five was good, then 10 must be better because I needed the additional medication to get the relief I had the month before. What I wasn't aware of was that I was building up a toxicity in my body. I was bringing my body to a point where it could not take it anymore. And yet I couldn't seem to live without it. But I stress that it's important that you know that I did not ever partake of any kind of recreational drug. I was a pilot, I loved my career. Never would I do anything to endanger my flying license. Not only that, morally I felt it was wrong. But this was prescription medication that brought me the only relief, the only relief. So I understand perfectly what people go through in addiction. And my heart goes out to them. It truly does. And so, as I tried to deal with this and have some semblance of a normal life, things began to deteriorate. I couldn't pay attention to my businesses. There would be days when I literally couldn't get out of bed. Um, I was going through the natural uh, process that anyone goes through of coming to the realization that my life would never again be normal. And that's a tough, pardon the pun, pill to swallow. And there I was. I said earlier that when you come to the end of yourself, you come to the beginning of God. And I was quickly coming to the end of myself. I didn't realize it, but I was coming to the end of myself. I, I, I envy so much those of you that have always had a strong belief in Jesus, in God, in heaven, in the goodness that lies within us all. Because I didn't. I literally had to die to find out what you already know, that heaven is real, Jesus is real, God the Father is real, the Holy Spirit is real. I had the proverbial wake-up call. I truly did. And I am so grateful now that I was, I guess, put through it. I never, ever thought I would be grateful for contracting that hideous disease. But my life now is so profoundly changed, so full of, of the love of God and, and understanding the family of God that exists on earth. And I've come to the, the determination that we Christians are, are too quiet. We need, and, and I mean, I know that there's all kinds of good works that go on every day, but that's why I'm so filled with this, this 
mission that I'm on to do the, little, the, the best that I can in the little ways that I can to make people realize that coming to the end of yourself and realizing the beginning of God is the most exquisite experience you could ever have to know, to finally realize you're not alone. There is a being that cares for you more than your own mortal family, that you were created for a purpose, his purpose. People say to me, what does God see in us? God sees himself. God sees himself in you. His light is within you. His light is within you. And as the light of my life was dying, as this disease progressed, there was a new light dawning within me. But I had to pass through the veil of death and return to explain how incredibly wonderful, how majestic, how truly stupendous it is to have the light of God within you. Those of you watching that already, many of you already know of, of that of which I speak. So I address this to those of you who are cynical or skeptical. I understand, I understand perfectly because I was just like you. I was just like you. Cynical, skeptical, mocking, scorning those who believed in an afterlife. How wrong I was. How truly wrong I was. Because as this disease progressed, and I could get no relief except by excessive doses of medication that completely altered the way I thought. And I knew it was altering. I knew it didn't feel like it was me. I felt I was up here watching me go through my life. And yet, to get the little bit of relief, to be able to sleep, to be able to have some semblance of the life that I remembered, I took that medication in dosages that I should never have taken. And so this event of my death happened a little over three years ago, in April, three years ago. So it's just a little over three years. It's really fresh. Look, it is as though it's not a memory for me. It's as though it's engraved on my soul. Everything that I saw, everything that I was told, I recall every instance, every nuance. Because once you see heaven, once you speak with an angel, and most of all, when you look into the eyes of Jesus, you are forever profoundly changed. Forever profoundly changed. I remember that day in April, three years ago. And it was a day that I, when I awakened in the morning, if it hurt to blink, and I mean excruciatingly hurt, I knew it was going to be an extremely bad day. And that, and I actually taught myself to blink one eye at a time to lessen the pain. Because as the myelin sheath on my brainstem was destroyed, all the signals going to the rest of my body were going haywire. That morning, I fell out of bed, dragged myself to the shower, took a handful of medication, which I was careful to hide from my wife. She's a good nurse. <laughs> she would have been most upset. But I had to. It was the only way I could function, I thought. And so I laid curled up in the hot shower and eventually took more medication, crawled downstairs to begin my day of pain, misery, and sorrow. Little did I know that that was the day of my death, but it was also the day of my new life in Jesus. You see, 
you must remember something. We live in the land of the dying. We go to the land of the living. Again, we've got it backwards. And as I said earlier, we must get over the notion that we are human beings with a soul. We are souls inhabiting a human body for a brief period of time. So once you think of yourself that way, a soul, a light of God, you will be forever changed. You see, you will be forever changed. We live in the land of the dying. We go to the land of the living. And so that day, I was around the house trying not to move. I got a call from someone that wanted me to look at some land I was having surveyed. And although I had ingested uh, medication, I made sure I had the presence of mind that I was on a black country road when I drove to this field. And uh, I, I remember feeling so lost and alone. Um, it was late in the afternoon. And as I drove up into that area, for some reason, when I parked the truck, I was facing the setting sun. I didn't plan it that way. I think God planned it that way. But I'm watching the setting sun. And I'm sitting there trying to get up the energy to overcome the pain, to be able to walk around that field and check the survey markers. And I remember thinking, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do this. And I sat there looking out at the setting sun. It's April. It's a beautiful day. The birds are singing. I can smell the grass. I'm sitting there in my truck feeling absolutely lost, alone, and filled with physical pain. And I remembered thinking, well, maybe if I just take a little more medication, I'll have enough relief that I can walk around this field. But I was dreading it. I looked down and I moved the, my gloves that were in the console. And there underneath, I had hidden a full vial of medication, prescription medication. Look, people say to me, didn't you know what you were doing? No. By that time, I had ingested so much medication, my thought process was completely gone. I mean, I don't think I could have added two and two. But I did know this, that the more medication I took, it, it didn't take the pain away, but it deadened the misery. I'm not sure how much medication I took, but I took too much. There was a bottle of pop. I took the medication and I sat back waiting for that wonderful warm feeling to come over the joints of my body that were in agonizing pain. And as I sat there thinking this is just too much. This, I don't deserve this. In my mind, I didn't. It's not about deserving. It's about the choices we make. And so I sat there waiting for that warm feeling to ease the pain in every joint in my body and to cease that throbbing in my head from the destroyed myelin sheath on my, brain, on my brainstem. And instead of that warm, tranquil feeling, suddenly I began to feel a burning sensation as though my feet were on fire. And then at my fingertips, and the, the, the tremendous sensation of heat came rapidly up my legs 
and into the lower part of my body and then traveled inwards. And this was completely different from any other sensation that I had had. This wasn't relief. This was something else. And it slowly dawned on me that I had done something catastrophic, irreversible, that I had ingested enough medication over the previous months and in that instant to push me over the edge. I believe with all my heart and soul there are six words, six words, and the prayers of my family for my soul that allow me to be with you today. As my lungs began to seize and I felt as though the truck cab was filling with water and I began to gasp for air, I knew I was dying. I knew that this was the last moment of my life. I remember raising my hand and it was trembling. And remember I said those six words? I said, I, I spoke six words. I cried out the first three words. My hand trembling before my face toward the setting sun. And I cried out for the first time in my life, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Not out of fear. I'd faced death a couple of times as a pilot, never flinched. But I had this overwhelming sense in the final nanoseconds of my life that I had wasted this beautiful life that someone had given me, that God had given me. And now, in the last moments of life, I was asking for forgiveness for wasting this gift. Instead of living a life of loving God and being good to my fellow man. I had lived a life completely self-absorbed, completely engaged with my own satisfaction and my own pride and arrogance. And now, here I am in the last seconds of my life asking for forgiveness. It is etched on my soul, those six words because I think it speaks to all of you who yearn for a relationship with Jesus. Please remember, and I have people say, well, how can you have lived the life you lived and then God forgave you? I, I can't explain the forgiveness of God, but I feel a real affinity with the thief on the cross that was crucified with Jesus in the last seconds of his life. He asked that Jesus remember him in paradise. I didn't say those words, but my, the feeling that rose up from me came from a feeling, came from a place in me that did, I didn't even know existed. God, forgive me. And he did. He did. And so it was at this point that I began to realize that my life was ending within the next few seconds. But I had begged forgiveness. And with that, I remember my head falling forward, striking my face on the steering wheel of the truck, and I was gone. I was gone. So you see, we must remember that we have things backward. We tend to think of ourselves as human beings with a spirit. In fact, we are spirits inhabiting a human body for a brief period of time. I look forward so much to telling you the rest of the journey because what awaited me was beyond any belief, any imagination that I could ever have created within my own mind. And I'm going to tell you all about it. And so, please, I, my prayer is that you take this experience of mine and use it in your own lives. 
to remember the forgiveness of Jesus and how he stands ready up to the last nanosecond that if you truly are contrite and you truly mean what you say, you can't pull the wool over God's eyes. You simply can't. It has to be heartfelt. It has to come from a part of you that you didn't even know existed. And when that prayer rose up in me, all that I had kept inside of me, my entire life poured out in those first three words. God, forgive me. And he did. Have you ever wondered what heaven is truly like? Do you know someone who questions life after death? Now you can know the testimonies of people who experienced life after death. You will receive James D. Woodford's brand new powerful book, Heaven, An Unexpected Journey. Through this book, you will read about his firsthand experience with heaven, angels, and the afterlife. Encounter the glories of heaven and the stunning reality of the unseen world. Understand what it's like to hug an angel. Encounter the chilling realities of hell and the sights, sounds, and sensations of heaven. Read and hear first-hand accounts about the awesome beauty of Jesus, full of overpowering love and compassion. Gain faith to believe God for your own healing as you understand that God has a body parts room in heaven where miracles are waiting to be accessed. Take a tour of God's heavenly library with volumes of books that contain the accounts of each person's life. Learn how your prayers are converted into visible fire and rivers that ascend to heaven. You can get a digital copy of James Woodford's book, Heaven, An Unexpected Journey, by clicking the link below or by going to sidroth.org heaven.